SCCT invites you to Las Vegas for SCCT 2022. Over three days, July 15th through 17th, attendees can get a complete overview of the cardiovascular CT field. Planned sessions are targeted for all levels, new practitioners and experienced providers alike. Sessions also range from general overviews to state-of-the-art research and expert discussions. Visit scct.org for more information. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Donut of Destiny, the podcast on all things cardiac CT for anyone interested in cardiovascular imaging. I'm your host, Praveen Ranganath, and I'm a radiologist from Dallas, Texas. Today, we will jump into the second part of a great conversation between my co-host, Nidhi Madan, and the legendary Dr. Martha Gulati. Conversation topics include pregnancy, childcare, and advocacy efforts for women in cardiac imaging. Enjoy. I do want to ask you about how you think these challenges that women face about underrepresentation, how do they vary from training to early career to mid to late career? Is this something that how, how what's, what's your perspective on how these things might change? Yeah, there's different different things that happen at different stages. And if we're lucky, when you're a a fellow in training, for example, I hope none of you experience anything adverse. I hope those environments are as good as the environment I experienced at University of Chicago, where I felt, you know, certainly there was things that occur that you know, could have been better. But in general, I would say we were never made to feel like we weren't welcome as cardiologists. But I do think at certain places, especially places that don't have a lot of women, there can be both macroaggressions and microaggressions that occur to women. And we've all heard these stories. We need to create safe training environments where women don't experience these things. And I, I, again, I hope it's getting better. I think where we are in positions of power or leadership, that we do everything to make sure that everyone has an excellent training experience and doesn't deal with the kind of crappy things that shouldn't even be part of training, that they, we should just be supportive and try to be considerate and think about the things that people sometimes that are unsaid or said under the breath or jokes that, you know, might be even not intentional, but they can be hurtful. And I hope for trainees that we, we stand up for them. So us as attending, should, when we hear things like that, we should stop them and say that joke was inappropriate because it's very hard for a trainee to ever say that. Mostly they have to laugh or giggle or whatever and just kind of brush it aside and move forward. Because if we spent all day talking about the small stuff, we'd never get any work done, right? But When we enter the career as an early career, there's different things because I think that's usually the first time that people realize just some blatant discrimination. For example, salaries. When you're training, you're just excited, first of all, to find a job after so many years of, you know, training, training, training. And now somebody's actually going to pay you for your work. And it, it is very exciting. But one of the worst things that can happen is when you are hired and then you realize that you are actually underpaid than somebody that they hired at the same time or that's just a few years above you or below you and you realize they got paid more. I think the one thing our community really needs to do is have more transparency about how we pay people and be honest about it so that everyone feels validated for the work that they do, but also don't feel undervalued. And I think that that is something just across cardiology overall is a big issue. And we know that women are underpaid. We know this just worldwide for every job, but in medicine where the gaps are great, there are huge gaps between men and women. And where are the gaps the greatest? In the highest paid professions within medicine. And that tends to be cardiology and orthopedic surgery, where the gaps are particularly glaring. And I think that there's a lot of job dissatisfaction once you find out. You might like everything else about your job, but when you realize you're paid less than somebody who's your equal, 
it, it makes you doubt, like, what's wrong with me? Why didn't they pay me the same? And, and also you start disliking your job. You're like, oh, I, you know, I always say yes. I do everything. I, you know, I'm the team player here when nobody else wants to do it. I go on every committee or I do everything my boss says, and yet I'm not getting rewarded the same as somebody who might, you know, who might be a man who might actually also say no to a lot of things. And so I, I think that we we need to improve our environment. And I think at early career, sometimes you don't know it right stepping off from fellowship, but it starts coming to light at different points when you realize these issues. And I think it it also affects people as they get promoted, whether they're in private practice and start, you know, whether they're taking a leadership role in the private practice or whether in academics you're going up for promotion, women go up for promotion later, sometimes by choice, sometimes because of childbearing, and sometimes because they don't think of them. Their boss may be like, okay, this this person needs to go up for promotion and that, that person happens to be a man and they don't think about the women. They also make assumptions about women. Women may or may not be having children but even if they're having children, there's no reason that they have to delay going up for promotion. Just because you're a woman and just because you're having children doesn't mean you're on the mummy track, as people call it. You can do both. We've seen many women do both. And for some women, they might have a different set of circumstances. They may not have children or they're choosing not to have children or they may not be able to have children. And additionally, they might have a spouse at home who takes care of a lot of the things that they that would not delay them in terms of promotion. And I've seen that there. I've seen a lot of women where their their spouses are way more helpful than you'd realize, and they are making it possible for that person not to step off or delay their time for promotion. So I think we just need to reevaluate how we think about both men and women. And I think that that really is kind of, I, I know you wanted to talk eventually about the paper we wrote recently, but that that paper, I, I know it was directed at women, but I, I will say that there's a lot of the issues we brought up are actually issues that are for men and women. And I think when we make it a man and woman issue or a you know non, non-gender based issue, we can do better. We we can realize it's going to make our environment overall better for anybody who is practicing cardiology and that will make our place more welcoming to everyone. Absolutely. And on that note, I'd probably have us dive into some of these family and childbirth related challenges that uh, women face in their training, in their uh, practice. And I know Navigating this can be really tough. What would be your perspective or advice or on the resources that might be available for women to help them navigate these family pregnancy challenges as they go through? Well, I wish it wasn't. I wish the onus wasn't on the woman in cardiology or the woman in medicine. I think the onus really should be on the leadership within the hospitals or within the practices to figure out how can we best support the women in our practice to make it possible for these life events. I mean, it, it's a normal part of life to to have children and to need maternity leave and things like that. And I think we need to make it, put more of the onus actually on the institutions per se, so that they know what's expected of them in order to have women in their work environment. And I think within our paper, you know, that was published in Jack, I hope people will go and look at the supplements. I know that's really weird to ask people to go and read supplements because I know many times I'll read a paper and I never look at the supplements. But the reason we we put them in there and we knew it was too much for the paper, we already were, the, Jack was quite generous in the number of pages they allowed our paper to be. But the, the supplementary pages are both for the hospitals, the practices, as well as the women, because it provides the legal 
legal framework for the, the re- legality around maternity leave. Right now, we, you know, the United States particularly is the only Western country without a national paid family leave policy. That puts people at a disadvantage because, you know, in some states we may have really great resources. For example, Massachusetts has great resources. On the other hand, many other states have no maternity leave and no intention of providing something that they they don't have to. The one thing that we provided, though, is the things that are illegal. And that's what I think is really interesting about our paper, is that when you read it, that there is quite a number of people that wrote in things in our survey. And we found that a great number of them had actually experienced things that, you know, troubling practices. Actually, three quarters of our respondents reported troubling practices that are actually illegal in many circumstances. And that's why we felt so strongly about providing that supplementary material. It's what the legal laws say is the first off. And then resources for institutions or for a woman in cardiology, for example, to take to their HR to say, listen, it is, you know, if you're not giving me a place to pump, that's illegal. If you're not giving me time for leave, that's illegal. If you're calling me while I'm on maternity leave, whether it's called maternity leave or if it's your sick leave, whatever they, whatever's provided to you, they actually can't contact you when you are out. And yet many women reported that they are still answering emails. They're being asked to answer their patient questions because nobody else knows their patient. These are the kind of things were really happening to women in cardiology. And, and, and I think that those things, I think we all, you know, we just do them because we're soldiers in our community and we just like, we want to come back and have a good relationship with our coworkers and with our boss. But these things shouldn't be happening. When you're taking leave, you really should be taking leave. And it's interesting because we wrote this paper with three lawyers and they are actually great resources as well. And so they are from the Hastings College of Law, the Center for Work-Life Law, and particularly the senior author on our paper, Dr. Joan Williams. She is an expert in this area and actually has been the author of many of the cases that have come up about women in in all professions, to be honest, not, not medicine, where they fought for laws to be put in place related to women and maternity leave. So the, first of all, Hastings has a huge resource. The Work Life Center has tons of resources. We put them into the document as well. But you can also go to that site and, and even access these lawyers who will help you through difficult, challenging times, which I think people don't realize, but these are, are they turn out to be women, but they are women lawyers who are really helping us advocate for this. They were shocked to learn what was going on in medicine, so much so that that actually is what inspired me to do the survey, was when I was at a meeting with with Dr. Williams, and when I mentioned something that's just kind of normal in the cardiology community, which is paying forward your maternity leave so that nobody else takes your call. And she's like, what are you talking about? That, that can't happen. And, and she was, there was a bunch of cardiologists and we we're all like, oh no, that always happens. And she was shocked. And I was like, okay, we need to find this out and what's legal, what's not legal. Because for me, the biggest issue as a chief of cardiology at the time was trying to hire women. And particularly in a state that really, and a hospital that didn't have any really good regulations to protect women. I found it very hard. You know, we'd lose out women who would choose to go, especially early career folks who knew that they might want to get pregnant and they will choose a place that's more, more welcoming environment for them, given that they know what might, might happen in their life. And I don't blame them, but it made it very hard because we're not playing on a level playing field. And I think that this paper was really inspired on how do I get more women into cardiology and to make young women see how welcoming we are. It needs this really, it needs a a federal mandate, but it needs us as a community saying, we're not going to stand for this anymore. 
I completely agree, Dr. Gulati. I've, I've seen so many coworkers and even in training who struggle with keeping up with their professional activities and then going through pregnancy, taking care of their little child right after pregnancy with, with a very variable, as you alluded to, very, very variable maternity leaves that they are offered. Yeah. So I think this is definitely a challenge that many, many women in cardiology would appreciate finding these resources. And this paper definitely brings this to light and highlights these challenges. So I'm thankful that you really led this paper and helped us highlight and emphasize on this one particular aspect that women face. I think delving from that uh, note, I know we've talked about underrepresentation of women in cardiology. We've talked about family and pregnancy challenges that women face as they go through their career. I think the other question we had for you was, what would be the first big change that you would like to see in helping women cardiologists, women physicians succeed? What would be that be that one thing, one big thing? I think perhaps the the biggest thing we can do for women in medicine in general is really the things that we've been talking about, like making sure that we are bringing women into leadership roles, that we are recognizing their accomplishments and recognizing the importance of a more diverse workforce. And I think that it's just changing what we used to consider norm. You know, if you, you, sometimes you'll go to different medical schools and you'll see on the walls all the past chiefs or chairs of the department. And they do tend to be predominantly and historically, understandably, men and often white men. And I, I do think it's getting better, but we need to be pressing to keep changing that because it's not that we're trying to do it as tokenism, but it needs to become a norm that you can have men and women in leadership. Their leadership style is going to differ. There's things about that are maybe more stereotypically women and some things that are more stereotypical men. But until we see them in leadership roles, we're not going to be accepting of things that are different. And so I think the biggest thing is that as we push at all levels, the one that perhaps is the most important is pushing in the leadership roles because that it has a trickle down effect for literally everyone in the community. I hope to see more women in, who are aspiring to be in those roles and rise up to the leadership forums and leadership roles. I hope that we can make that effect. To that note, what do you think men can do? Men in medicine can work together with women. How they can work together with, with women or what they can do to effect these changes. Well, I think the most important thing is to remember the men. There's many great men out there and they they want to see more women in leadership and they want to see women rise and they're advocating for us. We need to engage them in the programs that we're doing to advance women. So don't, you know, whenever we have a group on, of women in cardiology or women in cardiac imaging, make sure you have some men, male members, especially the men who have power, because you're going to come up with great ideas, but often in Currently, our leadership often has a lot of men. You need them to be pushing at the highest level. It's one thing when we're talking in a room of like minds. We need it to go up to the people that can give the money or give the ability to make change. And so the, the allies we always will need, and the, you know we call it the hashtag is he for she. We need them in the room and we need them pushing for change at the highest levels. And I, I, I think we shouldn't forget the, the male allies because they are going to be the greatest advocate for change for us. In our current state, they are the ones that often hold the power or have the right connections to people that will really influence change. The last one that I have for you has a we wanted to have some fun note to our conclusion of this interview. And we all know that you have so many amazing accomplishments. And many of us wonder, including myself, how is it 
that you're able to do so much in one day. So we would request you if you could walk us through your morning routine to how you get yourself ready for your day. Yeah, most of most of you, if you follow me on Twitter, perhaps know how I start my day. I, you know, I'm very big about routine. I think most of us in medicine are, and my routine since I was a child has always involved running. You know, when I was a kid, I think I used to get up so early that my parents didn't know how to tire me out. So, eventually, my mother asked my father to take me someplace to early in the morning so I wouldn't play the piano at 5 a.m. And so my dad took me to a, a field and he said go run and yes I did and I guess I never stopped but every day for me starts with a run it's for me a great way to clear my mind and you know think about what I'm going to do in the day or think about nothing to be honest sometimes I'm singing in my head or just you know, enjoying what I'm seeing, the sunrise and my dogs. I run with both my dogs. I'm actually somebody who doesn't even take a day off of running. I run literally every day. I don't believe in days of rest. I, I know it probably goes against anything in medicine, but but I don't, <laughs> don't take days of rest. And for me, it, it is the way that I feel good every day. I feel, you know, it, if there is a day, rare day that I miss running, which really is a, really a, really, really unusual. I, the whole day I'm off, I'm always thinking about, well, I didn't get my run in and I'm kind of crankier. And so I've just learned it doesn't matter. Even if I have an earlier start, I just get up earlier because I know psychologically it doesn't work for me to miss my run. And I think finding whatever that, you know, we all need those moments in our day, those moments of, of joy and moments that are just ours. And I, whether it's some people aren't morning people, I get that. So maybe it isn't in the morning, but whatever time of day to make some time for you, because we do need, you know, we talk about the diastole, we're always in systole all day long some point of diastole should exist in every day. And for me, that is when I'm running. I love how you compared it to our sister in diastole. <laughs> I am definitely motivated. I'm going to start to work myself in the morning and try to get to a run, which I never can do, but I just don't have to definitely try. <laughs> Coming to our final concluding thoughts, Dr. Gulati, I want to first thank you for joining us, for um, starting our Women in Cardiology and Women in, Im women in Cardiac Imaging um, series of uh, women leaders. And we all have learned a lot from you. And I'm sure our listeners will enjoy listening to this conversation and learn from, from, our, uh, from our talk today. Concluding thoughts, I wanted to ask you, if you had your final three pearls for women in cardiac imaging that we want our listeners to hear from you. Sure. I would say the, the first thing is, is women belong in cardiology and, and also in cardiovascular imaging. I think there's probably no area more exciting than cardiology. I mean, and particularly imaging, and I'm not an imager, I just use it. You know, so I, I feel a little bit fraudulent even being on this platform. But I'd say, you know, that all the exciting initiatives with cardiac imaging, whether it's for me as a preventive cardiologist, how I can use it, but there's tech, there's artificial intelligence, there's so many things changing. And, and we need women and the interesting ideas that are will come from women as much as we need for men. And I think that that is the first thing to remember. You belong there. I think also for those of us within cardiology at different levels, whether that's early career, whether that's training, whether it's at senior points of our, our career, remember to apply for positions, whether you're not going to get them if you don't apply. So if you want something, nominate yourself or ask somebody. I, you can always ask me. I'll always freely nominate somebody who wants to do it. I might just ask you to do the paperwork, but also nominate others. Think about other junior people. Be their advocate. Be their ally. 
think about sponsoring a young trainee. And that can be even as a fellow in training, you can think of somebody that's junior to you that you want to see rise up, that you see something in them and you know their greatness and mentor people as well. I mean, that is our job, no matter where we are, it is so important. The third thing I'd say is remember that there's room for everyone at the table. There isn't a finite number of women invited and it isn't a competition. I think sometimes people forget that. And I think we should really think about bring more women. What do you, the only way we're going to get to that 50% is to get more women there and we're not anywhere near it. So bring more women to the table. And I know you only asked for three, but I'm going to add a fourth. I, I, you know, amplify other women when you can. It doesn't always mean that you agree with them, but when they speak, I think it's much harder for women's voices often to be heard. It's just a nature, our voice, many of us are soft speakers. I'm definitely one. And I think sometimes it's hard for me to get my voice heard in meetings. And I think one of the greatest things we can do is when a woman has an idea, amplify her voice. So if if you say, you know, I think it's a great idea to do X, if I'm in the room, I should say, oh, Nidhi had a great idea. I love that idea. Did you hear what she just said? She said we should do X. What do you all think about that? That actually works and helps raise the voice. It reduces the appropriations, as they call them, and the man the man interruptions that occur commonly within our community. And I think these are little things, little tricks we can all do for each other to make our environment better for all of us. Those were fantastic thoughts and great advice, Dr. Gulati. I, I certainly learned a lot myself, and I'm sure people who are listening to this can get something from this talk and be able to apply it to whichever stage in their career they are. And I again want to thank you so very much to being with us today and sharing your insights into how more women can be part of our wonderful world of cardiology. Thanks for having me, Nidhi. Thank you so much, listeners, for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed the conversation between Nidhi and Dr. Gulati, which was done as part of the Women in Cardiac Imaging series from the Society of Cardiovascular CT. If you like what you hear from us on the podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe to us. Once again, this is the Donut of Destiny. Cheers. <laughs>